So John, tell me, when did you first realise you were gay and um, when did you share that information? Well, I first knew probably when I was about four, at about the same time as I believed myself to be called by God to be a minister. And I kept it, uh, well, both things had to be verified later in life, you know, but I always sensed when I was a wee boy that I, I was attracted to boys more than to girls. Now I went out with girls, you know, and almost got engaged to a girl. It wouldn't be until I was uh, 22 that I admitted to myself that I was gay. And who did you share that with first? Or did you keep it to yourself for a long time? Well, I kept it to myself until I was 22. Um, I cannot actually remember. I mean, I do remember that probably two years later, I, I told my parents. Um, but I think, I, you know, having admitted to myself was the big thing. Mm. And also that was part, that was a part of the kind of religious experience because I had also to admit that to God. Mm. And then to, I suppose, accept that this is the way that God had made me and God knew whom God had called. And then when I was, yeah, when I was 24, I told my parents. So John, how did your parents react when you told them and, and what about your friends? My parents were fine. Uh, my mother curiously said that when my brothers, I've got twin, young brothers were twins, that when they were, when we were all boys, um, she had prayed to God that none of her boys would be homosexual. And, and I think that's because she grew up at a time when that was almost synonymous with being a, a paedophile or homosexuals got imprisoned and she didn't want that to happen to mm. any of her sons. But they were fine. And my friends, that was no difficulty at all. I mean, the, 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 my regret was that I never was able to say to the girl who I had gone out with for three years, the reason why I broke off a relationship was because I discovered that I was gay. Mm. But the rest of my friends, I don't think it was a surprise to them, you know. And uh, by that time, the word gay was becoming more common in currency. And we were talking about 1973-74. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 never, I never really found any rejection among my family or my friends. John, did being a gay man compromise in any way your desire or call to be a minister? No, I had to think about it seriously. I did consult a senior minister in my church who had quite a lot to do with the selection process. Uh, and he, he said to me, um, uh, what do you like with women? I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you're scared of women. I said, certainly not. He said, okay. Well, I would. Uh, I don't think this will forbid you from going forward to ordination, but I think you must be careful of the people who you tell about it. So that was really it. I mean, I had been accepted. It sounds quite precocious, but I think I'd been accepted as a candidate for ministry when I was 18 or 19 before I realised or came out to myself that I was gay. And I felt it was only fair to ask someone who was part of that process uh, in the light of my new information about myself whether they wanted to make a comment. But you no, know, they were. He was, he was encouraging that I should go forward. And I never felt, I mean, as I said, I, I believe that God knows whom God calls and that I didn't expect that the path would be particularly easy, but I didn't doubt that this was my vocation and this was my sexuality. How do you deal with uh, scriptures uh, that prohibit uh, same-sex activity? Well, uh, I was in a convent last week, a Catholic convent in America, and there was a, a leaflet which was stuck to a notice board. It had a picture of Jesus on it, and then it had the, the line, what Jesus said about homosexuality. I was quite keen to see what Catholic nuns were talking about, and I opened the leaflet, and it had nothing there. Now, that's not to say that because Jesus said nothing about homosexuality, therefore everything's okay. Um, there are six verses in Scripture, uh, a couple of verses in Leviticus, a verse in Romans, a verse elsewhere, which are contentious in as much as they come from contexts different from the ones in which we now live, with different understandings we have now about sexuality than we had then. But, but also, um, when we're talking about same-sex love, 
that's a different thing from same-sex aberration, and a whole lot of what has been pointed to in Scripture is aberrant behaviour. So I don't, I don't have any difficulty with Scripture. There are, there are vast tracts, particularly of the Hebrew Scriptures, and some of the words of St Paul, which I accept as being in Holy Writ, and therefore the inspiration for the blessing for the education of God's people. But I will not allow my faith in Scripture and my faith in God to be predicated on whether I subscribe fully to six verses in Scripture. You know, we have, we have abundant verses about how people of God should deal with wealth. I don't think anybody's been had up for failing to go along the lines of these verses. We have a third of the Psalms which deal with malicious gossip as being perhaps one of the most pernicious sins we don't have anybody who goes in front of a, a, a ecclesiastical court because they've been maliciously gossiping their MDLs. But on this subject, some people hide, I think it's hiding behind six verses, and I don't think it's good to play at ping pong with scripture. John, have you experienced much conflict or discrimination? Uh, yes and no. I'll deal with the yes first. Uh, I was outed when I was about 32. Somebody gave some information to a Sunday Mail and a reporter contacted me. I answered in a way in which he never took it any further. He'd also phoned my employers, the Presbytery of Glasgow, and uh, I was called up before them. And they uh, said, uh, we have had this indication that you're homosexual and that you're living with another man. And because I'd taken vows to the church, uh, I, I thought, I have to be honest, and I said, that is true. The living together was a kind of convenient thing, because at that time, we bought a house for £6,000, which you could never do now, and that was cheaper than renting, you know. We, so we lived together, and uh, I was made aware that, that there was a choice for me, which was to continue this relationship and forego my status as a minister, or forgo the relationship. And so uh, the relationship ended. Uh, I have some regret about that, but I don't know if it's the relationship that will lasted all my life. Um, so we stopped seeing each other and we went different ways and uh, still occasionally are in touch with each other. And since then I have not entered into a permanent relationship with any other male or female for that matter. But apart from that, uh, there's been really uh, nothing. Uh, I haven't made a big issue of speaking about my sexuality in public because there are other things that I believe God has called me to and I wouldn't want to be branded as having a single issue, uh, which sometimes, you know, some people who've got a passion for one thing or an experience of one thing, that's all they talk about. Well, there's more in my life than my sexuality and there are other things in the Gospel to speak about. Why did you go public? about your sexuality at Greenbelt? Uh, it's partly to do with you. I'd heard you speaking to, uh, on the radio, the recording of you speaking to General Synod in 2017. And I uh, heard of Liz's death. And I, I thought, this cannot happen. You know, people should not take their own life because they're gay and Christian and faith and their sexuality seem divorced from each other. And the church should not be a place where people are so marginalised or silenced or afraid to reveal their true selves that they do something as awful as that. And it's, you know, I feel it was a kind of, um, it was almost a kind of divine uh, request. This is maybe the time when you speak publicly about this, and if that helps to defuse uh, the antagonism or the, the the annoyance or the confusion that people have, then maybe that's the thing to do. So uh, at the end of a talk, uh, which was not about Lizzie, but at the very end I said the reason why I'm giving this talk about homosexuality and faith is because I have an investment in it and also because I heard of the death of a girl and that should never happen again. And one of the interesting things is that uh, about maybe six months later, I was working in 
No, it was, it was, it was only th three months later I was working in Texas and I was approached by a woman who came from a fairly conservative church and she said, um, I hear that you said something about yourself at a conference in uh, England. Oh, I said, uh, yes, I think I may have. And she said, well, I'm really glad you did that because that prevented a girl in our congregation from taking her life. And then I talked to a woman who is in her mid-70s, maybe late, older than that, and she said, uh, and, and also I thought they're going to be censorious, this woman, you know, kind of straight-faced American. She said, uh, I heard what you said in public, and she said, so I thought maybe it's time I let people know that I also am gay. At the age of 76, for the first time in her life, a faithful Christian, feeling that that part of her identity had to be hidden. So, yeah, that's why I spoke.